Well, welcome everyone for joining us for this uh, launch of our new Recovered Books Boiler House Press edition of Time Stood Still by Paul Cohen Portheim. Um, and with us, we're very delighted today to have uh, the two other contributors um, to our reissue of this book, uh, Andrea Pitzer um, and uh, Panikos uh, Panayi, um, who uh, are, are, as I was talking with them just before we started, they're some of the few people I know actually read this book before we came out with our new edition of it. So I was very happy to, uh, to have their support in bringing this edition out. I'm going to start with a few comments about uh, Paul Cohen-Portheim uh, to give you a little background on him, uh, because he is a complex character. Uh, although I think we all agree this is an amazing book, um, he himself has issues that we need to be aware of uh, in today's world. And uh, then I'm going to ask uh, Panikos to talk a little bit about the context of the book within the context of internment of uh, German civilians and internment of non-combatants during World War I, uh, which was kind of like, it wasn't the first time that happened, but it really became uh, a, a widespread state policy. And then finally, we're gonna ha uh, have some uh, comments from Andrea Pitzer, uh, who uh, talked about this whole issue and the history of uh, concentration camps and internment camps in her book, One Long Night, A Global History of the Concentration Camp. Uh, so let me start by just sharing a few slides here to talk about. So uh, yes, we're launching this book. It came out the, on the 30th of November, and hopefully folks are finding it easy to get copies through whatever retail arrangement you prefer. Um, so Andrea, has got three books and I know she's working on another and, and actually you're sort of stymied. Uh, are you still stuck in terms of making a return trip to the Arctic? Um, yeah, the Russian Arctic is not really the place for an American to go at this moment. So. <laughs> oh, well, um, well, we're, we're looking forward to it because believe me, I've read all of her books and they're, they're, they're terrific. They're page turners, they're mind openers. Uh, and that's, I mean, those are the things you ask for in a nonfiction book, I think. Uh, and Panikos has got quite a list. This is just a sample. I wanted to highlight uh, that he's a, he's a very versatile uh, writer. So on the one hand, uh, we see uh, his uh, books that deal specifically with this issue that uh, Time Stood Still, which is, is about, which is about internment of uh, civilians and prisoners of other types uh, during World War I. Uh, but he's also written a number of more popular books, including some food history books, which I love. Uh, and if you've ever been uh, to the UK, I, I can highly recommend Fish and Chips because you will learn much about that ubiquitous, still ubiquitous, although I have to say, you know, it's harder and harder to get fish and chips in London. There's just that one place in uh, uh, near Covent Garden, the Rock uh, and Soul place. Uh, really, I don't know where else you would get it in London. Although, you know, I lived, uh, my wife and I lived in Norwich. And, and uh, of course, there were a number of really good places there that, uh, to get it. So Paul Cohen, oh, go ahead. Sorry, in central London, it's an issue. Outside central London, it's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's good to know that institutions being preserved. So Paul Cohen Portheim, um, an interesting, he's he's sort of in some ways sort of like an archetypical Central European. Um, I I was writing about another writer uh, who's being slowly rediscovered now, Rosemary Tonks, and in every one of Tonks's novels, she has these ambiguously Central European characters who seem to be German or, I mean, Paul Cohen Hart, Portheim is variously described as German, as Austrian. Um, he was fluent in French. He lived in, in Paris for many years. He actually was born in Berlin. He was uh, um, of a Jewish family. 
uh, and he was very artistic. Originally, he actually found himself in England because he was working, uh, he was painting. He was just on a holiday painting in England, uh, and uh, the war broke out, and he got stuck. And as he tells the story, uh, eventually goes from simply being kind of uh, um, unrooted and, and idling his time to actually being uh, interned first in Nakalo on the uh, uh, Isle of Man and then at Loft House, which is where he spent most of his time. Uh, so this is the first camp he was put into uh, Nakalo uh, on the Isle of Man. And this is sort of commemorated now. Um, and there is a fair amount of information. In fact, there's a nice website about Nakalo uh, if you're interested in knowing more about that camp. And then he was shifted to Lofthouse Park, uh, which is a former, I think it was a former racetrack uh, that was taken over and made into this internment camp. And it was considered the gentleman's camp. Uh, it, you know, they they wore their clothes, they they gardened, they pursued hobbies. Uh, so they they weren't physically tortured. But I think one of the uh, powerful things about this book is how uh, convincingly uh, Cohen Portheim uh, conveys essentially the inhumanity of taking people and putting them in, in a, any place with literally nothing to do and nowhere to go and uh, having and and particularly they had no idea how long this is going to last that's one of the points that I think uh, David McCullough used to make this when he talk about writing history, which is the people who are there don't know how things are going to turn out. So, and it's our it's our nature in most cases to to imagine the worst. So here he is in this place, and he is just seeing one day pass to another, and um, and he does give us such a vivid account of all the little things. I, I one of the passages I quoted when I first wrote about the book was how he notices how you, you know, day in, day out, how how maddening hearing someone slurping soup off of their spoon day in and day out can be. Uh, after, he, it was interesting, after he uh, came out of uh, uh, internment, he was uh, released and he had some time that's described in the book in, in the Netherlands until the end of the war, and then he became a writer, which he was not really doing much of before, at least I haven't seen any evidence that he was a writer before his time in the camp. And his first book was uh, published uh, in um, German. Most of his books were actually written in German. Time Stood Still, I think, is about the only one that he wrote in English. Uh, the rest of them were translated. So his first book was really in German, I guess it, it's Asia as a teacher or as an educator. Uh, it came out after he died as Message from Asia. And, and it's sort of, uh, um, it's interesting to, to, to know about this book because he's very open towards the wisdom of the East, as we might put it. Uh, whereas later on, he writes some things that are probably, I'll, I'll show you an example of one of the things he wrote that it it does put your teeth on edge. Uh, he wrote a number of uh, travel books. So this is uh, one, uh, Spirit of Paris, a beautiful, uh, the original cover was uh, painted by Cecil Beaton. Um, and he also wrote uh, one called The Spirit of London, a little, more, not a Cecil Beaton uh, cover. Uh, but he also, as time went on, became kind of convinced of um, some theories that we might not, that probably don't sit that well with us today. And so this is something he wrote for The Sphere in 1931, uh, where he says, and I, ha I quote this, uh, the British Empire today is a necessity to England. Its importance for Europe lies in the fact it is a champion of the world supremacy of the white man. And, you know, it's ironic, we're uh, just a few years after uh, his death, after he wrote this, of course, uh, he would have been considered a post persona non grata in Germany, his own native country. And in fact, we were about to see the 
all the horrors of the Holocaust. So, you know, this kind of mentality was certainly used to um, for very bad uh, purposes. Uh, and it's it's a little distressing to see that that's kind of where his mind went uh, towards the end of his life. Uh, he died within a year of writing that, uh, uh, or a year or so. So he died in 32. Uh, he had actually gone down to Portugal uh, because he was uh, in ill health, and apparently something happened. He was hospitalized, and his doctor in Portugal uh, recommended he go back to his home in Paris to recover, uh, which he did, and then within a few days of, of returning to Paris, he died in uh, 1932. Um, and uh, yeah, it was recorded. It actually, his books did very well, uh, comparatively well in both the UK and the US. So this is this is from a newspaper in Alabama of all places. Uh, so this is you know the wire services put out. Uh, the news of his death, and uh, it was, you know, pretty widely publicized. But from that point on, most of his works have kind of fallen out of print, and Time, Time Stood Still was one of the quickest ones to become unavailable. So with that, I want to turn over for a moment to uh, Panikos to talk a little bit about I mean, give us an idea. How many, how many German nationals were interned by the British during World War One, what are we talking about in terms of rough numbers? It's probably it depends whether you're looking at. Um, so most of them are interned in Great Britain, and then there's um, so maybe thirty to forty thousand, and then another wow. ten thousand to twenty thousand outside. So in other parts of the British Empire. And uh, so if if I put it into um, wider context so i think when i first um worked on on this many years ago it was my phd thesis the enemy in our midst which you saw earlier germans in britain during the first world war um i concentrated on on great britain and basically the the story of internment was one of the many ways in which german nationals who lived in great britain um when the first world war uh, broke out were disenfranchised for want of a better phrase so um there were all sorts of so there was a very germanophobic um atmosphere uh the, the property of germans was confiscated um at the same time all sorts of legislation was introduced to prevent the, the movement um of germans and um the you know one of the key, the other key so it was uh getting rid of their property, confiscating their property, um, preventing movement um, and all sorts of other measures. It was the Aliens Restriction Act, which also uh, prevented them from changing their names, from becoming naturalised. And then the third element of the disenfranchisement, if you like, of the Germans um, was internment. Um, but I mean, since I've worked on that, I've, I've, I've so I initially I assumed that the Germans who were in turn were all living in Great Britain. I mean, there was a there was uh, fifty three thousand Germans, depending on how you count them, who lived in Great Britain when the First World War broke out. But the people who are interned aren't just those people, um, and the government. So so there's three types of people who are in three types of Germans who are in turn. Um, if we deal with the other two groups um first the first group is actually the british empire well okay you've just given us this quote from cohen portheim about the british white man <laughs> controlling the world and and this comes through uh in in um in internment um so if you are a german who was on a ship crossing the atlantic uh, either way, or even if you're a German um, in the Pacific, somehow, if you if you if your ship was intercepted by a a, a royal naval ship, then um, you would be taken to the nearest place of uh, British control, the nearest British territory, and interned. Um, so it, let's just stick with the example of crossing the Atlantic. Um, you were escorted. Uh, your ship was escorted. Let's say to Cornwall. 
uh, and then you were taken off the boat and then you might spend the next four years in internment camps. Uh, it could be in one internment camp. It could be in a series of internment camps. And as you said, be, well, the main one is is Nokela, which I'll touch on uh, in a minute. The second way is is, is like po Cohen Paul time. So Cohen Paul time is quite interesting because he's just passing through in the wrong place uh, at the wrong time. And he's probably... Um, maybe the smallest of the three groups who's mm -hmm. interned he's just unlucky to have been in <laughs> in in britain or where he was painting on the south coast of england which he said he did every um summer um and um when the first world war breaks out he's not initially interned and then he says he you know, receives a knock on the door uh in may 1915 when wholesale internment is decided by the british government and uh he's told um he asked the policeman, how should I prepare? And, and the policeman says, you should prepare as if you were going on holiday. And then he comments, it turned out to be a very long holiday. And so the long holiday right. <laughs> lasted until 1918. And then the third group is the long-term uh, British uh, German residents uh, in, in Britain um, who are um, lower middle class and, and middle class. So one of the most important jobs is waiters. So if you went to buy a meal in a London restaurant, let's say in 1911, there was a, a big chance that you'd be served by a German waiters. They also owned um, uh, bakers, uh, shops, butcher shops and barbers. So they were the three of the most important. So I guess the other thing to say here, which is really important, it was it was males who were interned. Um, mm -hmm. So it was males of military age, 17 to 45 or 17 um, to 55, um, depending on, on what the government have decided at the time. So it varied. So so women, only a handful of women in World War One uh, were interned uh, by the British government. Um, and at the end of the war, um, there was a process of which I'm very happy to <laughs> to describe as ethnic cleansing of, of the Germans. I mean, I think there seems to be this sensitivity um, amongst a lot of historians that the British don't do ethnic cleansing. I mean, I'd probably argue they uh, might even have invented it. But anyway, that's a <laughs> subject for another day. But I mean, the the, pop, the population of Germans goes from 53,000 census of 1911 to 19,000 because the, because they're deported so I, I right. think that that phrase works quite well so just you know the final point would be about um the the camp system so the the headquarters of the camp system is 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 is, is an Ocalo on the Isle of Man so that holds a maximum of about 23,000 um prisoners oh. so you had that um picture and i guess you have to imagine twenty three thousand men in this space at its height i mean it varies uh during its existence and then so that 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 was opened at the end of 1914 and it was regarded as the main camp it was the main so it's not just germans in britain it's germans brought from all over the world uh in this camp um and then uh, when the war broke out initially the, the government couldn't make up its mind so there were temporary camps and then you also have another a series another group of long-term camps so if we just focus on britain it was not um loft house park which was mm. where um which is in yorkshire uh, near wakefield and that lasted for about three years um and uh, alexandra palace in in north london uh, was another long-term one and then there was also so this issue of some camps housed um, civilian internees and then the other group which I haven't looked at there's also military prisoners who were brought in from the western front and there's some so some camps are initially uh, civilian camps and then become military camps um, so in a sense I guess um, Paul Cohen Paul Times experience is just reflects um the, the the lives of 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 the German community in Britain um and I you know I, just to sum to finish I mean I discovered it very many you know when I was doing my PhD and it is sort of stuck with me since that time and whenever I come back to this uh to this theme um <laughs> Cohen Paul Times I mean you know I I can remember um, some of his 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 sentences going back, you know, all those years from the 1980s mm -hmm. when I when I did uh, my PhD. So I think he speaks um, for all Germans interned in Britain in the First World War. I guess just one final quality. I mean, he's highly educated. Most of the Germans who end up in internment 
um, aren't highly educated and maybe they didn't well they wouldn't have had the ability to write you know a text like this and they may have been more used to you know if they were waiters they would have been uh had more experience of less space of sharing accommodation mm -hmm. but then on the other hand a lot of the other themes he he brings out you know about the the uncertainty of internment the the date right. of internment that um so you know i i just he speaks for all germans in in who are interned in the first world war i would say can i ask um it, it, you get the impression from his book that the government came up with these camps and came up with the idea of internment sort of after the war broke out as a reactive uh, kind of measure that it took them a while to say, oh, this is, even though, as we know from uh, Andrea's book and uh, of course all other camps, that they had experience from the Boer War of uh, mm. internment. Is that something that in World War II, they turned around and kind of did automatically? Uh, well, when the Second World War breaks out, they had they had actually planned for internment. So they had, uh, you know, plans to undertake it. And, and then, but it, no, it's equally confusing. Well, it's, what they do is they divide um, uh, Germans and Italians when the Second World War breaks, breaks out into three groups of, you, according to their threat. Um, so the most threatening, I think, is Group A, um, and so they're in turn straight away. But then um, nothing very much happens until 1940, when um, you know the 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 Nazis um, have taken over most of Western Europe. The fall of France in June 1940, and the declaration of war uh, by Italy in Britain. And there's there's a sort of mass internment, but um, that sort of quickly uh, withdrawn within. So so most people are interned in in june 1940 are released quite quickly a lot of them are german jewish refugees so the government realizes its error um quite quickly some of them are deported to north america and you have the aaron dora star this ship which is carrying is deporting people to to america and then is sunk so a lot of italians are killed but i mean the answer to your question is um they have plans but i they you know it is I guess policy on the hoof is the phrase that we're we're looking mm -hmm. for. So it happens in World War II in the same way as it does in World War One. I. I think the main difference between World War One and World War Two is um, that in World War One, the you know these poor Germans are spend the whole war, you know, with because there's not this process of sifting people out. And so it's a far lengthier process than it was in World War II. So in World War II, it's mostly people who are regarded as an as a threat. So Nazis in particular are the ones who spend the whole war, war behind a barbed wire. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That really, uh, to me, it helps. Uh, Andrea, uh, Andrea, sorry. Um, let me uh, switch to you to to talk about, you know, you've written about, uh, I mean, as you put it in the title of your book, The Global History of Concentration Camps. So how does this, I mean, how did you come across uh, this book and, and where does this fit in the whole scheme of uh, interning civilians as a state policy? So I first, um, I came across this book in 2008. And I was working on my Nabokov book. And in the Nabokov book, camps come up again and again and again. And he actually, in one of his novels, has a man who is exiled in Russia during uh, as a as a foreigner during World War One and is effectively held in there was a kind of remote exile that was not a formal camp the way we think of it. But many, many people were dislocated who were enemy aliens. And this man was there and he went almost insane. He said if he had, he read like 1,018 books. And if he hadn't had those books to read, he would have gone mad. And the answer is in the novel, he actually has gone mad. But I was like, I didn't, hadn't really thought about all these people during World War I. I mean, I knew about World War I internment. So I went looking for a history of this and I couldn't really find it. And so I decided after I wrote the Nabokov book, maybe there needed to be an idea concept book of how did these camps, how did mass civilian detention on the basis of identity without trial kind of come into the world and how do we get to a place like Auschwitz. Um, Nabokov's brother had been 
uh, held in World War II as a homosexual. And so there were just camps kept coming up again and again. So I was doing an archive search in the New York Times archive on internment and concentration camps. And of course, that term concentration camp is often what was used for these camps, although it would, we now think of it as something much more horrific. I'll talk a little about that in a second. But I, I did archive searches for it, and I came across the review for Time Stood Still. And I thought, oh, that looks really wonderful. Um, you know, I should get that book. And I was still working on the Nabokov book, but I did get a copy of it, which I'm glad because it became quite difficult, uh, which is one of the reasons you're bringing it back into print, but it became quite <laughs> difficult to find it. Yeah. So I was glad that I had a copy of it. Um, and in reading it, I found that he had so much insight and he had so much deep empathy. He was very open about his sort of privileged nature and even comic, even makes fun of him self for wearing the white suit that he packed because he was told that he was going on holiday, you know, that that he was going to wear this completely inappropriate attire, but as an assertion of the self. And I right. think that that's a really sort of wonderful way, as we know from sort of what he became later, perhaps it wasn't entirely only, you know, he was perhaps asserting some aspects of his superiority, but he's very conscious of his privilege. And he, in this book, still has this very deep empathy and, and you know, for all the different prisoners that he encounters, and he has these incredible insights. And, you know, I wanted to write about global internment when I did turn to the concentration camp book. I wanted to write about it during this period. I only have three and a half languages, and this was really a global phenomenon. So I went to the international headquarters of the Red Cross in Geneva, and French is one of my languages. And it was the diplomatic language of the time. So right. they had a policy at that point where they put everything in French. It would come in in one language and it would be translated into French. And for the languages I knew, the translations were pretty good, at least the ones I ran across. So I read, every, I mean, it, you know, it was an endless amount of material. The number of people were held, the Red Cross visited more than 500 camps in 38 at least countries. It was really, as you said, this global phenomenon in that moment, which was incredible. Well, 38 things that would become countries or were colonial territories at that right. point, I should clarify. And out of all of those photos and, and uh, descriptions by third persons and logs written in first person from people they had spoken with, the Cohen Portheim book was the one I felt had sort of the most historical insight, even though he himself doesn't actually know a lot about what came before or what came after. The observations he made about his life in the camp were very, very telling. And so for each of the chapters, I tried to use one internee in a given system to sort of provide the narrative while I'm also putting in these larger historical ideas of how many people, how many places around the world and all this. So I used his his book as the background story for that chapter were one in tournament. And the thing was that, you know, he had also, and I think Panikos mentioned this in his uh, addition to the to this reissue, that one of the things that's great about this narrative is it starts before he's interned. And we see the daily life devolve in England. Um, you know, the, the sinking of the Lusitania, I don't think we've mentioned here, but that was a really critical moment right. because internment started before that. Um, they had rounded up people who were suspects. They So all along the stage, they were interning people. But there was this tremendous public pressure to intern everybody that was that had been born in Austria, born in Germany. And there was really a lot of resistance to it, which I think is pretty honorable in retrospect. There were people in government who said, this is not necessary. I'm maybe Panikos will remember, I'm forgetting who it was in this moment. But um, one of the ministers brought before parliament and interrogated, why aren't you locking everybody up? We should lock everybody up. He basically says, for the the you know the German baker that's been here for 30 years, there's no more danger than from your average British criminal. I mean, which was kind of a shocking thing to say in that moment, because at, in the same era, you have people literally asking in published opinion pieces, do Germans have souls? Which is mm -hmm. also incredible to realize from this historical moment. But when that passenger liner is sunk by a German U-boat, then there is sort of uh, the government ends up falling at me. I'm not linking the two. Uh, there's many things going right. on in this. Right. There's a lot of moving parts. But you have this pressure that no longer has the pressure back against it. And you have a whole additional swath of people that are interned. And Cohen Portham tells us this 
like from the beginning of his experience being there. And you can sort of see what's happening in the society as restrictions are heavier and heavier. He is completely oblivious to most of this and finds it out kind of in shocking ways. And and so it's it's very um capturing and, and almost entertaining in a strange way. He's the the naive guy, right? Who's swept up in this historical moment. And then he also talks about what happens after he's released and things like mm -hmm. people couldn't walk in a straight line on the street because they had been so accustomed to walking the length of the camp and then having to turn and turn that this idea of just like forward motion without restriction is psychologically traumatizing right. or has right. to be navigated. And so I also really like that he, we had the larger story. It wasn't just what happened inside the camp, but it was also what that meant when they went back into society, which was a really critical part of it. And I also think a key thing for why the book was so valuable for me was that he understood that he had suffered a lot less than everybody else. And he says in the book that he actually like improved himself, that it made it into right. a positive experience and all that. But I think when, at least for myself, when I'm reading that book, I'm very dubious of this still, even though he managed to come out and make a great life for himself. The things he even says about how he felt, it was obviously a deeply traumatic experience, even though he yeah. makes right. something quite positive out of it, becomes a writer, becomes very introspective and all these other things. But, but he did know that for his own good fortune, I want to read this one quote from him here, that he quote, it, that his own good fortune, quote, must not prevent me from considering a disease a disease, a disease, nor induce my readers to think that what I call good, that I, I'm sorry, to, oh, I blew the whole thing. Let me start up. He must not, it must not prevent me from considering a disease, a disease, nor induce my readers to think that I call a good what in itself is evil. And mm -hmm. that was really telling to me. He is seeing World War II has not happened, Nazi camps, gulag, none of that has happened yet. And he is seeing to the heart of the dangerous, not just potential of what camps can become, but in their best form. Like this right. was about as good exactly. as concentration camps got. And, exactly. and it was harrowing, right? It destroyed everybody. He says other than himself, he didn't know anybody else that hadn't been deeply affected and harmed by their experience. And I thought that was... Uh, I didn't want to cherry pick only stories that I agreed with. I tried to bring in a lot of different kinds of stories into my book, but I thought that was such an insightful and amazing conclusion for him to reach, given that he couldn't have the hindsight that we now have. He couldn't have the foresight, in other words, to see into the future. And so to put it into the historical context, and I don't want to take all our time, I know there's going to be questions and stuff, but the influence of the World War camps in history, it is enormous. It cannot be overstated. Before that, camps were used predominantly in colonial settings. Um, the best known ones probably would be the British ones, but also Spanish, Germans, Americans in the Philippines. Um, mm, you know, right. they were seen as barbaric. They were seen as a last resort tool when they weren't even necessarily applied that way, which one could argue that perhaps they weren't at some points in the Second Boer War. They degenerated into that. The numbers of women and children that died far outpaced combatants frequently. They were seen as horrific. What World War I did was to normalize them. It rehabilitated right. the concept. It made it palatable. There was a whole bureaucracy because it was the British Empire, of course. When Britain decided to do it, it was done around the globe. And then other countries were doing it in retaliation. Um, and, you know, Germany had some colonial holdings at that time, although not after World War I, of course. And so what you saw was it was the globalization of what had been a controlled sort of wartime phenomenon. And it became incredibly normal. It was great that the Red Cross went in and observed these. And yet it also made it seem like they weren't so bad. Yeah, it was exactly. great that there were lending libraries, but of course it also made it seem like conditions there weren't so bad. And so what you get is that after World War I, camps continue. And each country has its own culture and history and dynamics that it folds this globalized idea of locking up civilians preemptively with. And so it's sort of like... Um, I think of it as the colonial camps is kind of the root of the tree and the trunk of the tree is these World War I camps. And then, of course, they flare out wildly mm. into these different branches that go many different directions. But um, you were talking, Panikos, about the British intercepting people at sea. And 
one of the people the British intercepted who wasn't even an enemy alien was Leon Trotsky. And they put him in a Canadian internment camp. And then he comes out, he writes this diatribe against concentration camps. It's like, this is what democracy gets you. Concentration camp, look how I was treated. I wasn't even an enemy alien. It becomes mandatory reading for the Red Army, his pamphlet on his internment. And of course, they immediately start using it in the Russian Civil War. Right. Um, the British use some of the laws, some of the things for Irish, uh, during the Irish War of Independence, you see this kind of internment. Um, the first camps that the Russian Civil War have go into the Gulag. And so we think of these horrific systems, but really these camps were normalized all over the world. You had homeless, you had vagrants, you had, and they were called concentration camps. I just want to be clear at this time. And they were used in Europe, in North America, in South America for undesirable civilian populations that you could just move them to the side, lock them up, and that that was somehow acceptable. The Tulsa Race Massacre, which many people have learned about in recent years because of television and other things, they were used then. The surviving members of this Tulsa community, this Black community that was so traumatized by having their neighborhood destroyed that day, were locked up in a theater, which was called a concentration camp by newspapers in that era. And until Black people were missing from white households and not doing their servant chores, they were locked there. Then it became all right. White people could come and vouch for them and bring them out. But I just, I don't want to, um, it can't be overstated how influential these World War I camps were. But then, right. of course, we get to the Gulag itself. We get to the Nazi camps. We get to the most horrific iter you know, iterations. We see the emergence of death camps, which we now imagine as what concentration camps are. But they really had this long history before. But I don't think you can get to those Nazi camps without a tradition of people turning in when they're told to report themselves, when right. they get a prisoner number, mm. they wait out their time as a national pariah in detention until this conflict, until this social stress is ended. And the lesson from World War I was, and they would be released. Almost everyone, not everyone, but almost everyone made it out of the camps that went in to those World War I camps. And of course, mm -hmm. in World War II, it was a very, very different result. But the social training and the social global response to those early Nazi camps, again, pre-death camp camps, was a much more confused reaction, I think, because of that World War I template that people had in mind. So all of that is to say they were hugely, hugely influential. And I think that um, Paul Cohen Portheim could not have imagined the twisted forms that the camps would take on later and targeting people even like himself. But uh, in time stood still, I think he gets to the essential nature of what is inhumane and wrong about this whole category of detention. Right, right. You know, thank you for that. Uh, I one of the things I find uh, really remarkable about the book is that, unlike so many, you know, memoirs, it's almost as if he was a trained sociologist, you know, his way of, of describing the system of the camps that he was in and, you know, analyzing the personalities and the cultures and, and the routines and all those things, you know, it is, you know, it's not, it's not just, here's my personal reaction to this. He really does try to put it into as much of a context uh, and and to kind of approach it from a logical, uh, uh, you know, each chapter kind of has a theme uh, once he's in the camp. Uh, and and that's, you know, that's one of the, to me, that's one of the extraordinary things about this book that makes it such a, a remarkable resource is it's not, it's not just his personal experience. He is really trying to say, I need to capture this as a phenomenon that needs to be described to other people. And I think that he, it, it, it feels to me in reading the book, it appears to me that he went out of his way to include people who obviously should never have been put in the camps, the, to make clear that there were many errors, not just in judgment, but in bureaucracy, yeah. that Things that were promised didn't happen. Um, the you know he even gives the dimensions allocated again for each person. Mm -hmm. So there is almost an ethnography of the camps that's happening, 
from somebody who's beautifully fluent in English uh, and a really good writer and feels very wronged about what happened to him and these other people. But he really, I think the magic of what he's doing, and I don't know how you turn into the superiority of the white guy stuff later <laughs> from this deep understanding he has in that moment and writing about it more than a decade later to, to see uh, he would back up and say, but people were trying to do good this way, or they thought it would be a favor this way. He's giving so much um, credit to the people who are actually trying to make some kind of a difference, even when it doesn't work. He he could have written a much more condemning book. He could have written a much more fire and brimstone kind of book, but he clearly set about to do something else. And I just don't know if what we see him doing is exactly what he was thinking he was doing, or if it's just that there was just a beautiful felicity and synchronicity of, right. of you know, right. all of it. Right. Absolutely. That's a good point. Uh, well, let's open it up. Uh, we haven't got a, a huge audience here, but if uh, there's anyone who uh, wants to chime in, just raise your hand or type in a message in a chat. Um, I want to ask while we're waiting for questions, uh, Panikos, talk about uh, how how you came across the book. I mean, you 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 were working on your PhD, but uh, I mean, you just happened to go down a go along the shelf and pick out a book and uh, discovered it, or did you uh, did you know what you were looking for? Um, I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure I can remember exactly how I <laughs> discovered it. I mean, I remember one of the few. Um, pieces of work that that had emerged at that time was by someone called Caesar Aronsfeld and he wrote a book about uh, sorry an article about Ger German Jewish enemy aliens in World War One and I wonder if I if I um, found it from there and it must there must have been I think before we came on there there must have been a copy in the British Library um mm -hmm. but uh <laughs> sorry uh, but I wasn't you couldn't really um make a whole photocopy <laughs> in the british library at that time so i could do it in the, you can't in now the either but no you can't now I'm but not. i've heard that people do it <laughs> so uh, so have i but in this strange annex in the um in in the in the london school of economics library which no longer exists there was a copy and so i grabbed a copy and and, and found a photocopier in the lse library and, and managed to do the whole photocopy and what I intended to do. So I went to Germany to do a research trip and I was, uh, I wanted to contact a publisher in 1987 to reissue the book. And then I don't know, and then I never got around to it. So, um, you know, when you contacted me, as you remember the email, do you want right. to do this in one second after I got the email? Yes. <laughs> Cause you know, it was sort of something I'd wanted to do, you know, 35 years previously. <laughs> Well, and, oh, and I oh, should oh, say, I Brad, so, so glad that Brad you did your... I want to give you credit before we move on, which was that when I actually turned to writing the camps book and I had this copy of this, I looked, I was reading and I was like, this is an amazing book. Why isn't there more? And I looked online and there was the neglected books review of it. <laughs> so you were the first thing, your review of this book was the first thing I found online while I was reading it saying, why aren't oh. more people talking about this? So, wow, that's great. So I don't yeah, know what I mean, year I... you wrote that, but. Uh, it was probably around 2007 or eight. It was one of the earlier books that I wrote about, I think. Uh, I started the site in 2000. I mean, I've been doing reading and looking for these books for decades, but I started the site in 2006. And um, yeah, and I've been keeping at it. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, for, it's never been issued in Germany, has it? Not that I know. I wouldn't. Yeah, know. let's. Let's hope we're starting to see a little synergy on some of the books that we've reissued are being picked up by foreign presses and translated. Our first book, Gentleman Overboard, has done phenomenal. We've now, uh, it's, uh, editions have come out in, I think, soon to be nine or 10 different, like, like Arab, there's an Arabic translation wow. uh, due out soon. Um so there are, I mean, this there's this sort of informal network. So I I hope it does get picked up, partly because I mean we have internment camps with us today. Well, that's uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on a little bit was that that um like 
first of all, that idea of do Germans have souls, which was a legitimate topic. And there were stories of, um, you know, German soldiers impaling babies on, you know, on their bayonets. And I mean, there were these dramatic, dramatic stories. And there was plenty of horrific violence that was happening in World War I, absolutely. But the way these stories were sort of curated and assembled, there was a narrative of making the uh, opponent evil in that war in a way, uh, using propaganda in ways that had just become sophisticated in recent decades. And I think it's something that, like camps, we've really seen stick with us in unfortunate ways. And so I would really want to encourage people that the the roots of this idea are when you say some group of people by nature of being members of that group are irredeemably evil, are irredeemably dangerous, cannot assimilate, et cetera, et cetera. That is the root of concentration camp. Something has to be moved outside of society and isolated in some way, right? And unfortunately, it's how we have the Rohingya camps, we have Uyghur camps, you know, we have the border detention that's happening in India, we have border detention in the US. Yeah, in the this US, is yeah. not a phenomenon that has left us, but we just don't call it concentration camps as freely as we used to, which should be good, but uh, but has the doubt, I mean, Auschwitz should be the first thing we think of when we think of camps, uh, absolutely. Um, and at the same time, how they got there is the other part we should keep in mind. And I think that's one of the valuable additions of this book because we clearly haven't, we've learned the Auschwitz lesson that that is to be memorialized and feared, but we haven't learned the lesson of the dangers of what comes before it, right? right? And and I think we're very much, you know, we have much worse camps than anything Paul Cohen Portheim was in in a number of places around the world today. Yeah, absolutely. But even even the kinder camps, I mean, that's part of the, what this book shows is, you know, the the dehumanity, the the torturous aspects of of just the fact that this this is not how human beings are supposed to live. You know, that we put them and, um, you know, and that's, you know, what what isn't I don't think we hear enough of is, you know, we have I mean, we have Syrian internment camps. We have internment camps here on, on our border. We you know, the UK has internment camps right now for for people who have struggled to get across the channel. Um, and we don't, um, you know, what we don't hear enough of is essentially the voice of. Okay, so I mean, how long? How long are people spending in these camps? And I mean, we know the horrible stories we heard uh, a few years ago with the uh, children being separated from their families uh, here in our own uh, border in, uh, internment camps. You know, the fact that that's that is, you know, that isn't it isn't kinder because we're not shoveling them into ovens or we're not beating them or working to death working them to death like a place at like Mothaus and you know it's not kinder it's 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 a you know it is it is a, a pretty terrible thing for states to be doing and also the evidence is that that it's not necessarily effective in the fundamental aim to which it's it's trying to achieve in the first place usually the governments that institute uh this kind of detention are doing it for political ends and out of some kind of desperation. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it isn't just, it's not sound policy. <laughs> and I mean, it doesn't right. usually carry out. It's usually an attempt by a government to, to keep or garner power, like from the most, what we would call anodyne forms to the most serious forms. But the problem with having even these lower key better forms is that it takes very little for them to be transformed into something much worse. And I think of the French camps uh, in Southern France on the Spanish border um, in the thirties. And with Spain, uh, in the Spanish civil war, when Franco's forces started gaining momentum, you had hundreds of thousands of people in a very brief period of time fleeing across that border. The French were already very politically unstable at that moment. They did not want, the more conservative uh, members of government did not want all of these very far left radicals pouring into their cities in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was they isolated them out in the middle of nowhere in what turned out to be horrific 
horrific conditions. So not trying to kill them off, not any of those things, but people got extremely sick. Well, then the camps stayed open, the war starts. So then they become enemy alien camps. And there's a huge number of Jews fleeing Germany that end up prisoners in France um, when, uh, you know, at the end of this um, sort of Franco era of the camps, then they become these enemy alien camps. France falls, the Germans have access and control to it. And then people are are shipped directly from these camps, often through Paris and Drancy. Right, right, right. And so yeah, the right. possibility of these camps, they're never static, right? What are they in this moment? Doesn't it all say what will they become? And so the longer yeah, we the world, I think the more going dangerous. Portham would have ended up in one of those French camps, undoubtedly, if he'd lived. Um, because he would have been resident as a enemy alien in France, too. I mean, that seems to be where he had settled after uh, after leaving England. So, um, yeah, a comment uh, in the chat about uh, how he writes about time itself being the arch enemy and needing to be killed. Uh, is this in keeping with accounts of internment elsewhere? I have to defer to no, Andrea I and... I mean, I think it's the one thing we haven't spoken about is, um, well, sorry, I've got the book in front. So he, he uses the one of his chapters is called, um, well, Barbed Wire Air and then another one, Barbed Wire Sickness. So there was this concept um, of barbed wire sickness. And one. so there were various causes. So there was a, a, a an account um, by a psychologist uh, Adolf Lucas Fischer um, about barbed wire disease, and and so it was a more scientific. Well, I mean, you know, it's scientific, um, and it has different perspectives from Cohen Port time. But one of the reasons um, that that um, Fischer gives um, for uh, barbed wire sickness, barbed wire sickness, because the barbed wire is the symbol of your uh, psychosis as an internee uh, in the First World War. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the things that causes um, barbed wire sickness um, is you don't know uh, about the, the end of your sentence. And I think um, Cohen Paul Time actually um, uses that phrase. So, yeah, it does come up in other uh, accounts and especially the the barbed wire uh, sickness account by by, mm -hmm. by Fisher. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of other reasons which are given um, for this psychosis um if you like you know separation from your um, family um but well, not working is i mean that's that's key to to current poor time so he has to develop all these um well he, he can carry on with these paintings but then he describes how difficult it is to do that because of the of the space confinement so mm -hmm. yeah I, you know he's 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 is the literary account and then there's also this very scientific account by fisher and it's interesting it's, that it, it was picked up that quickly. You know that uh, I was not aware of the of Fisher's uh, research, and and that it came out so. I mean, it was right then and mm. right right as it was happening. Almost, uh, it was being identified as a pathology. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think he quite coins the phrase. I mean, I've come across it from as early as nineteen sixteen. The the idea of barbed wire. Um, sickness in sort of writings of Germans um, who were interned in, in other camps, even military prisoners, um, actually. But it does, I mean, he he popularizes it and actually he, he bases his research. So what the, the reason he knows about it is because he's a Swiss camp inspector. So because there's diplomatic relations break off between Britain and Germany, you have the intermediary state, which at the end of the world, well, initially it was the USA. And then when the USA joins the war, it's Switzerland. So he's he's acting on behalf of the German government. He ma makes numerous visits, especially to Nokela. And that's where he develops all mm. his ideas because he sort of, you know, observes the wretchedness of their of their position and and their depression. You remember, he talks about gambling, um, you know, as another way of killing time, and he's very condemnatory uh, of this. But yeah, so it surfaces in about 1916, and then at the end of the war, um, he publishes his book, and it sort of formalizes it, if you like. Although, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's purely scientific or not has been open to debate. I think, right. 
I think that the the um, one of the sort of cleverest things that Cohen Kortheim does is that, you know, first it's a holiday, then he thinks the, all the, they're talking and the war is going to wrap up. I forget what it's like, maybe in two weeks or three weeks, it can't possibly go, then it can't possibly go past winter. And it's sort of this moving the goalpost again and again and again, where you experience it a little bit like they do, where it's like, we know, of course, how long it's going to last, but seeing what they imagined as mm-hmm. those endpoints is just really moving. And I think the barbed wire is also a critical part it didn't get patented and in mass distribution until like the 1870s, 1890s. And so mm. uh, this, you know, it really was part of the global thing that became part of the camps. You could hold a lot of people with automatic weapons and barbed wire in ways that mm. they weren't possible to hold before. And I think that new kind of detention was recognized very quickly by Vischer and by others that that this produced a different effect on people than, you know, than other just living in a village where somebody might tell you you can't leave feels quite different than that kind of mm-hmm. camp setting. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a byproduct of the industrial age in some yeah. ways. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions or comments in the chat. So uh, let's, let's go ahead and wrap up any last comments that uh, either one of you would like to make about the book. Uh, I, I have been told that there is a, a review coming out in the Times sometime within okay. the next week. So that would be great uh, to get some exposure to this book, because I think it is, you know, it, it really should, in my mind, and I'm biased, of course, but I, I think it should be a, you know, it it should be one of those classics that just stays in print and, and you know, gets widely read and studied because it's um, it's a phenomenal text in my mind. I mean, yeah, everybody, if you have anyone on the call, if you haven't read it, you should definitely get a copy and read it. I think it's a way to understand uh, much of the 20th century from a view you probably haven't thought about it before. Yeah, I mean, I think the only last word I'd like to say is I'm really grateful that <laughs> that you brought, brought it out again, because it is, you know, such a deeply analytical and important text in, you know, enabling us to understand incarceration. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, my goal for this series is really just to bring terrific, important books back into print so people can get at them. Because the one thing that I've learned when I went back to grad school was that, you know, really once it's out of print and particularly if it's scarce, it just fall, it's a cliff function. People no longer even look for it. And it becomes mm-hmm. that's that's really when it becomes forgotten. So simply having it, you know, available for one click ordering or however you want to purchase it uh, makes such a huge difference in in a text being accessible and being integrated back into our culture and our knowledge of things. Will, will there be an online version? There is an electronic version. Yeah. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we put all of our books out in in EBUB as okay. well, and Kindle, okay. and you know all the various platforms. So, well, thank you both for taking this time uh, to uh, to join this discussion, and to thank uh, the audience as well. I will go ahead now and stop our recording.